This is the actual start of stoichiometry, which will cover section 7.2 in the textbook. This is talking about gravimetric stoichiometry. Please notice that in the entire stoichiometry unit, you want to keep the unrounded values in your calculator until you get to your very final answer. So don't round or put it into significant digits until the final answer. All stoichiometry is, is a method of problem solving. We are always going to know the quantities of one entity, and we're always going to use that to find out an unknown quantity of a different entity. And this is always going to be within the same reaction. So what we need, always, 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 is we need a balanced chemical reaction. We need that balanced chemical reaction because we're always going to use a mole ratio to move from our known to our unknown. It's going to take a series of steps for us to do this. So what you will need, kind of like base knowledge, is you need to know chemical reactions, your balanced chemical reaction. From quiz number one, net ionic equations, you'll need to know what's happening when you dissociate or you ionize an acid or a base, and being able to convert from grams to moles and moles to grams, which means using your molar mass. So gravimetric stoichiometry is a method that we're using to calculate an unknown mass. And it's either going to be the mass of the reactant or the product that we're looking for. Gravimetric just means mass, mass measurement. So again, what we're doing is we're predicting the mass of a product, and we could also be doing uh, figuring out the amount of the reactant that we need in order to make the certain amount of product that we're looking for. Every single stoichiometry question, you're going to do the exact same four steps. First step, every time, is going to be your balanced chemical re reaction. Underneath that balanced chemical reaction, what I would suggest you do every time is list what you know and list what you don't know. So that means you're listing your measured mass that's given. You're putting down your question mark. Your question mark is going to show you what unknown quantity is required. And you're putting down your conversion factors. So that means you're writing down what your molar masses are for both your known and your unknown. Your second step is you're going to find the moles of the thing that you know. Your third step is you're going to use the mole ratio, and you're always going to need to use your mole ratio in this third step, and you're going to find the moles of the quantity that you don't know. And then the fourth step is to find your question mark. And that means you're going from moles to mass to find your question mark. So again, four steps, balance chemical reaction, find the moles of what you know, Use your mole ratio to find the moles of what you don't know. And then use your molar mass to find the mass of what you don't know. So your first step is always a balanced chemical equation. This diagram here is showing you your second, third, and fourth steps. So after you have your balanced chemical equation, you have a mass of something that you know. So your second step is going to be using your molar mass. And you're going to use your molar mass to find the moles of what you know. Your third step is going to be using your mole ratio, and your mole ratio is going to find you the moles of what you're looking for, your unknown quantity. And then your fourth step is going to be using your molar mass again to find the mass of what you don't know. Okay, so the question here is how many grams of oxygen are required to completely burn 10 grams of propane? I've written down the balanced chemical equation, so that is our step number one, and it's done for us already. What I've also written down is what I know and what I don't know. So what the question gave me is the question gave me 10 grams of propane, and it's asking for how many grams of oxygen. I also know my molar masses for each. Remember that oxygen is diatomic, which is why it has 32 grams per mole here. And I have my molar mass for propane there. So my second step is going to be I need to find the moles of what I know. So that means that my second step has to be I'm finding the moles of my propane. I'm going to do this two different ways. The first time I'm going to do it using proportions, and the second time I'm going to do it using um, unit analysis. So my first step here is I'm going to start with my 10 grams, and I know that I can put that equal to 44.11 grams in one mole, so I can say how many grams is that going to be in x moles. So if I do 10 times 1 divided by 44.11, going to get the answer of 0.2267 moles of propane. Again, I'm not clearing my calculator because I have to keep all of the decimals. The next step I have to do is I have to use my mole ratio to figure out my moles of oxygen. This is something that we've done in both gases and solutions. 
So I'm always going to divide by where I'm at and multiply by where I'm going. So what I know is I have one mole of C3H8 for every, I'm looking at my mole ratio here, for every five moles of O2. And then what's happening here is my moles of C3H8 and my moles of C3H8 are canceling out. So I'm taking the answer that's in my calculator, I'm dividing it by 1, multiplying it by 5. And I get 1.1335 moles of O2. So now I have to do my third step. And my third step is I need, sorry, my fourth step, I need to find my question mark. In order to find my question mark, I need to go from moles to grams of O2. So if I want to do this in proportions, I can say that I know I have 1.1335, and again, I'm not clearing my calculator, I'm keeping all the decimals there, moles, is going to be set up equal to, I know that I have one mole in every 32 grams, so I can put my x grams in here, which means I'm taking 1.1335 multiplied by 32 divided by 1, and my answer here, my x, which is my final answer, is going to be 36.27. When I go back and look at my significant digits, I need 3, so I have 36.3 grams. Final answer. I'm going to stick my final answer in a box so it's easy to see. If I want to do this by unit analysis, I'm going to start with what I know. I'm going to start with my 10 grams, and that is I have 10 grams of C3H8. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my mole ratio. So I know that my molar mass, and I need to get rid of grams, so I'm going to put my 44.11 grams on the bottom and my one mole on the top so that my grams and my grams will cancel out. Now I have moles of C3H8. So I'm going to use my mole ratio here. I'm going to put one mole of C3H8 on the bottom and five moles of O2 on the top, so my moles of C3H8 and my moles of C3H8 cancel out, and now I have my moles of O2. Last step, what I'm looking for at the very end here is grams of O2. So that means I have to put my 32 grams of O2 on the top and my one mole of O2 on the bottom so that my moles of O2 cancels out, and the last thing that I have left is my grams of O2. If I do the math here, I'm going to get the exact same answer, which is 36.3. So if I look back at this question, my first step was my balanced chemical equation. My second step was finding the moles of my known. The third step was finding the moles of my unknown. And the fourth step was finding my question mark. If you understood that example, then try some demands. Otherwise, I'm going to do a next example on the next slide. Okay, so here again, we're going to do the exact same four steps. My first step is balanced chemical equation, which I've given you here. Underneath my balanced chemical equation, I've written down what I know and my question mark, as well as my conversion factors. And in this case, because I'm going from grams to moles, I'm using the conversion factors of my molar mass. So what I'm starting with here is the question gave me 100 grams of iron. So my second step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the moles of my unknown. Again, I'm going to do it using unit analysis last and using proportions first. So if you want to do unit analysis, fast forward. So what I've done here if I, is I've set up that I have 100 grams of iron, and I've put that equal to my molar mass, and I did 100 multiplied by 1 divided by 55.85. It's going to get me 1.79. I'm not clearing my calculator yet. My step number three is going to be find the moles of my known. And I'm using my mole ratio, so I have to multiply this. My iron is on the top here, which means I have to put my iron on the bottom. And I know that I'm going to have, based on my mole ratio up here, I know that I'm going to have two moles of iron. For every over here, there's no number here. So for every one mole of Fe2O3, and then what I'm doing is I'm cancelling out my moles of iron and my moles of iron. So I'm taking my 1.79 and I'm multiplying by 1, dividing it by 2, and I'm getting my answer is going to be 0 0.895 moles of iron to oxide, which again, I'm not clearing my calculator because I want to keep all of my decimals until the very end. My next step again, I'm going to use my mole ratio. I know that I have 0 0.895 moles, and I'm going to set it up 
to my molar mass, which you can see up at the top, and I know that I have one mole over 159.7 grams, and I can put it equal to x. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my 0.895 plus all of the rest of the decimals and multiplying it by 159.7. My final answer is going to be 142.97. And what I can see up here is I need four significant digits, which means I'm going to have to keep 143.0 grams. I'm going to put it in a box for my final answer. Next I'll do unit analysis and I'm going to do it that in blue. So I'm going to start with what I know. I know that I'm starting with 100 grams of iron, and I, used, I need to use my molar mass, which means I'm going to have to put 55.85 grams on the bottom, and again, this is of iron, and I'm going to put one mole of iron on the top. That way what I can do is I can cross out my grams of iron and my grams of iron, so I've just gotten my moles of iron. Next up, I have to use my mole ratio, and I'm using my mole ratio in order to convert from moles of iron into my moles of iron oxide. So I'm looking at the mole ratio in my chemical equation, and again, I have two moles of iron for every one mole of iron oxide, so I can cancel out my moles of iron and my moles of iron. My last step, I have to get my grams of my iron oxide, so I am multiplying it by, I need my moles of Fe2O3 on the bottom, and my grams of Fe2O3 on the top. So I know that I'm going to have 159.7 grams, and again, my moles of Fe2O3, cross out my moles of Fe2O3, and if I do 160 divided by 55.85 divided by 2 multiplied by 159.7, I should get the exact same answer of 143.0 grams. Gravimetric analysis is often used in a lab. And in a lab, what happens is because lab technicians sometimes perform the same analysis hundreds of times every day, they're going to graph the data. For example, in a medical laboratory, they would measure blood and urine samples for the same things for hundreds of different people every day. Instead of doing the stoichiometry over and over and over again, what they do is technicians are going to read the quantity from a graph that has been prepared based on data that, they're, that they know. So they would take a blood sample that they know the concentration of sugar in it, they would do the calculation, they would uh, do the gravimetric analysis in a lab procedure, and then they would graph based on samples that they are confident in. This method is shown and explained in lab exercise 8A, which is on page 317. And what you need to do for the analysis question is make a graph of table number one, and then by looking at each solution, you need to be reading the mass of lead to nitrate off of it. When these gravimetric analyses are done in a lab, what they need to do is they need to make sure that the reaction is complete. That means that they need to make sure that the all, like every last bit of the limiting reagent has actually reacted. We do this by a method called precipitation completeness. You are going to first precisely measure your sample volume that has the limiting reagent in it and stir while you're adding about the equal amount of the excess reagent solution. So you're allowing the reaction to happen. As that happens, you're allowing the precipitate to settle until the top of the solution is clear. So that would look like that one down here at the bottom. What you do then is with a medicine dropper, you're adding a little bit more excess reagent along the side of the container, and you're looking to see whether it's going to make more precipitate or not. If you do see that there's cloudiness, you would see something like picture number A, and that's telling you that there still is some limiting reagent and it still could be reacting. If there's no cloudiness visible, then that means that your reaction is complete and you are finished.